If you clicked on this video, you most likely have an interest in ancient history. Like for instance, you want to know more about human evolution or ancient structures, maybe even theories surrounding the ancient world, or you want to hear the latest when it comes to new archaeological discoveries. And if that's the case, then I highly suggest you subscribe to the channel, click that bell icon to be notified whenever I upload, and if you enjoy my work and you want to support me, then maybe consider becoming a channel member or a Patreon. So I created a video about the human species of Homo naledi recently, and it's garnered quite the attention, but there was a lot of information that I have left out of that video. This has to do with the fact that um, <laughs> I prefer making videos under 30 minutes in length. I don't want to stuff too much information in the video and because that way information just gets lost in your mind and I'm also not really a documentary maker or anything or a professional so it's a bit too much for me to make videos longer than 30 minutes. My name is Kaylee and in this video we're gonna see where they could possibly fit into our current evolutionary timeline. I found a study and we're gonna look into it. So I hope that all of you understand that Homo naledi is more likely a side branch in our own evolutionary tree. I don't think they contributed to the gene pool of Homo sapiens. But to quickly recap and to freshen up the most important information about Homo naledi in your mind, let's go over what I discussed in the first video really quickly. In 2013, remains were discovered in the Dina Lady chamber in the Rising Star Cave. Deep inside the Rising Star Cave. And later on, more remains were found in the Lacedi chamber, also deep inside the Rising Star Cave system. And this is located in South Africa. These remains baffled the archeologists as they had a mosaic of morphology, combining archaic and modern features making it extremely unclear where this species falls into the human evolutionary timeline, including in which genus it should be placed. The discovery of these remains is considered to be the richest horde of hominin fossils ever discovered in the entirety of Africa up until this point in time. It also has the most comprehensive representation of the skeletal elements from multiple individuals across their lifespan and in both sexes. So during the excavations in the Dina Lady and the Lacedi chambers in the Rising Star Cape system, more than 1,550 bones and teeth were discovered, belonging to a total of 15 different individuals, of which six were most likely adults and nine were most likely juveniles and infants. These bones represent a total of 737 anatomical elements of the body of this species. This includes the skull, the jaw, the ribs, the teeth, the limbs, and actually you name it, more. So why did this particular discovery baffle the archaeologists? Well, upon discovery of these remains, the archaeologists assumed that the fossils would have been between one and two million years old. This has to do with the archaic morphology that can be found with like extremely ancient characteristics that we see in the Australopithecines and Paranthropus. But in 2017, the remains were dated using a technology known as ESR, which stands for Electron Spin Resonance. And another technique was used known as Uranium Thorium Dating, and this was used on three discovered teeth. The sediment in which the remains were found were dated as well by the use of uranium thorium, but also paleomagnetic dating methods. So it is quite safe to say that the dating was done incredibly thorough, and there seems to be no doubt about these results. The results, if I might add, were baffling the archaeologists. These different methods of dating showed that the remains of Homo naledi individuals date from between 335,000 and 236,000 years ago. That is a whole, a whole lot younger than the archeologists first assumed with their one or two million years old. That's insane. The archaic morphology is like a mosaic. It encompasses 
modern features, while at the same time, just to name something, have primitive looking shoulders that are perfect for climbing and hanging in combination with modern like human hands. <laughs> and that's just one simple example, but what made Homo naledi even more strange is the small brain size. There's only one species in the Homo genus that is similar in this regard, and that is Homo floresiensis, that I covered earlier in the year. Thumbnail here, I mentioned this one in the first Homo naledi video as well, but I highly recommend checking it out. So we know that the species of Homo naledi did not live inside the rising star cave system. And we also know for sure, without a doubt, for all the people in my comments in the last video, that the remains that were discovered were laid to rest deep inside the cave. They did not hid in the cave. They did not get stuck and perished there. The people were already dead. There are no signs of anything like that happening. And they clearly seem to have been laid to rest after death. So now that the most vital information about this fascinating species of human is freshened up inside your minds, we can look into why I am making this particular video. I started reading more about Homo naledi because I kept thinking about this mosaic of a morphology with all these archaic and modern features and I couldn't let it go. I, I, I made or I started like six different scripts but I couldn't let this one go. So I went on the old interwebs. And I found a paper that was published in 2018 that I did not find previously, where a selection of anthropologists tried to see where Homo naledi fits into the evolutionary timeline by comparing the skeletal and the dental remains of Homo naledi with other species from the Australopithecus and Paranthropus genuses and with other species in the Homo genus like Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis. And one thing was clear quite early on, and that is that Homo naledi's place in the Homo genus is justified and that the samples and the skeletal and dental remains appear to be most similar to Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis and Homo erectus. Of course, we need to remember that the three species that I just mentioned, Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis and Homo erectus, are quite a bit older than the specimen that we have discovered from Homo naledi. So, like at least a million years older. Another type of research that was done into the placement of Homo naledi was done in 2016, where the researchers used a Bayesian phylogenetic analysis on a supermatrix of craniodental data in Homo naledi and 19 other hominin species from Africa, Asia, and Europe. Evidence of that study showed that indeed, Homo naledi is a separate species, as it forms a clade with the members of the Homo genus, although its exact placement between the species of that clade is completely uncertain. But this paper that I stumbled upon from 2018 goes a bit further into the research. This paper presents the results of a phonetic analysis which is based on 78 non-metric dental traits that have been observed in a range of hominin fossils. And the focus is to try and figure out the placement and relation of Homo naledi to the other hominin species and the Homo genus. These dental traits were researched from the 15 Homo naledi individuals that were found in the Dina Lady chamber and from the three Homo naledi individuals that were found from the Lassetti chamber. And then compared to 10 different samples belonging to eight different species in the Australopithecus, Paranthropus and Homo genus. So most of these traits that were looked at were already re routinely recorded by paleoanthropologists, particularly the traits relating to the relative size variation and position of like the main molar cusps and root number, just to name a few examples. So why, I hear you think, <laughs> Why would they just look at the dental traits and not the other skeletal remains? The answer to that might actually surprise you. So these dental traits possess a high genetic component in expression, at least that we know of in recent humans. It's very easy for us to use these dental traits to see to which species a tooth belongs. So therefore, the paleoanthropologists consider the teeth of hominins 
to be the, um, so to say, safe box of their genetic code. So therefore, unless we have an extraordinary exception in which ADNA is found present in pleopleistocene material, these non-metric dental traits are the closest possibility that we have to genetic data of these hominins. So to very, very, very oversimplify the way the researchers looked at the dental traits is this. They rank scaled the dental traits and they had to be categorized into either present or absent. Like I said, very oversimplify it because pff, that paper was like not easy to read people. So the absent and present breakpoints have been consistent through studies carried out in the past. And therefore, this can be a good guideline. Of course, they did a lot more, but I don't want this video to be like 60 or 80 minutes long, so we're not gonna do that. So the original sample for this study of non-metric dental traits of Homo naledi consisted of 122 dental specimen from site UW101 in the Dinaledi chamber. But to maximize the sample size, Six specimen from site UW102 in the Lissetti chamber were included as well. So with how many different individuals from different species and multiple hominin genuses were the dental traits compared, you may ask. I hear you think. So from the early Pleistocene, they used 64 specimen from the Australopithecus afarensis, 138 from the Australopithecus africanus, 37 specimen from Paranthropus boisei, 166 specimen from Paranthropus robustus, 19 specimen from Homo habilis, 50 specimen from Homo erectus. So from the middle Pleistocene, they used 13 specimen from Homo heidelbergensis, Homo rudolfensis, and Homo rhodesiensis, and archaic Homo sapiens. And from the middle to late Pleistocene, they used 38 specimen from Homo sapiens. And lastly, from the Holocene, the agents in which we still live, they used 305 specimen of Homo sapiens from South Africa and 174 specimen of Homo sapiens from East Africa. Of course, the Holocene specimen weren't like from last year or something much older, but like from the early Holocene, start of the Holocene. So as you can imagine, this is quite the extensive study and having read the paper in which, if I might add, is absolutely filled with scientific jargon that even I had trouble understanding at times, this is a study that is of quite significance as well. All these 78 traits then were given a score for each species. The small sample size for a species may contain many traits, like they figured with Homo habilis, for instance. It scored very high, even though the sample size for the specimen was small. So when looking at the scores for the traits, it becomes clear that many species do not differ significantly, like uh, Paranthropus boisei, uh, Homo erectus and Homo habilis. Of all the species, the samples and their scores, Homo naledi is clearly the most divergent of them all which again baffles scientists. It has traits similar to Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus africanus, Paranthropus boisei, Paranthropus robustus, while at the same time sharing many similarity with early and later homo species like erectus and habilis, and sharing quite a high number of traits still with homo sapiens from the middle to late Pleistocene. It's baffling. So when looking at the samples and the results, it is clear that Homo naledi mostly resembles the species in the Homo genus, all while being absolutely, without a doubt, distinctly different. The highly uniform pattern of crown and root morphology in all specimen of Homo naledi is showing clearly the distinctiveness of the species. So the dental traits did not necessarily give us a clue as to where Homo naledi fits into the timeline. Although it does show beyond a reason of a doubt that the species does indeed belong to the Homo genus. But more on that later. So let's take a quick look at the cranial data because not only in the dental traits is Homo naledi most divergent, but this is evident in the cranium and the rest of the body 
which holds a mixture of shared and unique features that are relative to the Homo species. However, the cranium does not have many similarities and characteristics of the later Homo species. And most evident of this is the lack of a large cranial capacity. In the rest of the body, we see features that are Homo-like, like for instance, the relative long lower limbs, the muscle attachment, which is quite indicative of a striding gait, and some modern aspects like, for instance, on the ankles, the feet and the hands. While at the same time, because I wasn't done yet, I talked about this in the first video a little bit, the mosaic of the morphology shows skeletal traits of much earlier species that includes curved phalanges, wide lower thorax and quite ape-like upper limbs. Homino lady, why you make it so difficult for us? Could have been just so easy. So the conclusion that this paper comes to is indicative of the original qualitative taxonomic description that was published in 2015 that I mentioned in my overview video about Homo naledi. It indeed belongs into the Homo genus. It's got the mosaic morphology that includes archaic and more modern traits and the relative young age of the remains support the decision to place them in the Homo genus. So that's not weird at all. So for now, it just has to be put into the Homo genus. Unless, and this is a fun one, and I really like this, unless we discover evidence of an ancient Australopithecus or Paranthropus species that managed to survive into the middle Pleistocene. If that were to happen, it would change the entire perception that we currently have of Homo naledi. And if that species that we might discover one day is unique enough and similar enough to Homo naledi, it might even warrant the naming of a new separate genus. Because Homo naledi is that divergent. Of course, the chances of that happening are really quite slim to none. But at the same time, we need to be open-minded because we need to keep all our possibilities open. Stranger things have happened in the past and we are still actually at the very beginning when it comes to our understanding of the evolution of all these homonym species. So one day we might actually have a new genus in which Homo naledi belongs. And I'm excited to see what new technologies and new studies could bring to light and of course, new excavations that hopefully one day uncovers these missing pieces of the evolutionary puzzle. But before I end the video, I would like to invite you, the viewers, to join me on this incredible once in a lifetime tour in Egypt where I will be co-hosting and I will be taking you with me to an amazing selection of the most magnificent monuments, like for instance, watching the sunrise between the Paws of the Sphinx or a private visit inside the Great Pyramid, a four-day Nile cruise, the Valley of the Kings, both the Karnak and Luxor temples, and a whole lot more, like the Edfu temple, or Komombo, or the Serapeum. So if you want to join me, because I'm, I don't think I will do this again in the future, I think I will do this just once in my entire life. If you want to join me, go to adeptexpeditions.com to book your spot. And with that said, if you enjoyed watching, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you'd like to see more of these kind of videos, and click that bell icon if you want to be notified whenever I upload. If you haven't seen my previous videos yet, then click the card in the upper right corner, or click one of the links in the description down below, or you can click a video in the end card. And I would like to say a massive thank you to all my patrons and my channel members. I am eternally grateful for all your support of me and my work, and I don't know how to thank you, so... This is the way I can do it. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. And yeah, for the people that think they read Homo nailed it, you nailed it. Good job. <laughs>